in China under the dominion of the white masters and Christian missionaries. China was dying a million a day. Christian missionaries were walking down the street, pushing their bodies aside as a rich oil millionaire uncle of mine who did not want to re remind himself that he was once an Indian. He used to talk about pushing the bodies out of the way of little children as they starved in the streets of China. China had 600 languages. China was a divided people. China had the worst suffering and the worst torture and the worst famine that were ever known to history. But I did declare if they that did not express their knowledge that knew me, I would pick up the rock, the stone. And over in China, they threw out the missionaries that pushed the bodies aside. And my millionaire uncle that my mother once looked to and said, oh, what a perfect marriage he and his wife had. He never helped a little Chinese baby that starved. But I remember before he died, I wouldn't go to his funeral because I was just a lad because I came into the knowledge, I entered the temple of the Holy Spirit of truth. I was combusted as God when I was just knee-high to a grasshopper. I became the I Am long before I ever entered a church. They said, go to your Uncle Lester's funeral. I said, I wouldn't go to the dog's funeral. Anybody that would kick little Chinese bodies aside and say, well, you can't concern yourself about them. And they would kick themselves, these bodies aside. And he would go to what they call the American Club for whites only. And the missionaries went to it for whites only. And on the lawn of those American clubs, I want you to quit your laughing and look at me. Or I'll throw you clear out into Haiti. I'm talking over here in my choir. And so, on those yards of the American club of the rich, imperialist, American, fascist, wit, rich, wealthy interests, on the yard, even where the missionaries went, it said, no dogs and Chinese allowed. Twenty years ago, the Chinese were considered as dogs. But, my friend, my spirit is working there. And you have to be prepared that we may have no other victory than there, but absolute victory is going to come there. That same China today has an underground network of lead granite shelters. I read you yesterday, Ingrid Bergman, Ann Landers, they're overwhelmed with the love of the government of China for its people. Underground shelters that reach out like ant hills throughout their universe that accommodate millions of people down beneath the surface of the earth. Hospitals, doctors, stores, hotels, all underground. That should tell you immediately when a government provides underground shelters with a year of food stored, the only government in the world, the next government that does it closer is socialist Sweden and the next socialist Russia. But America does not have one shelter for its people. If a government does not provide a shelter or food for its people, or underground tunnels when a nuclear war can happen any minute, that will obliterate our cities. Dr. Kissinger said this week it could happen any minute over the oil crisis. And yet this government is not like China. The government there is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That government cares about its people. And it was in the newspaper, and I read it to you, and this actress, this rich actress, was overwhelmed as she spent her vacation just wandering through the tunnels and the hospitals and the dining rooms 
and the health care centers and the doctor's clinics and the hotels that were underground. Wake up! Twenty years. Nuclear war is going to come. The elements are going to melt with the fervent heat. That's why I wanted you out into the promised land because America was first and it will be last. It will suffer worse in this war than all other nations. For its government does not love its people. Its government has made no provision for its people. We don't even have four days of grain. We are not concerned. Rather than give milk to people, the government could buy it up because the government gives money to Lockheed. The government gives money to Trans World Airlines. The money gives welfare to the rich. Gives money to keep the rich richer. But it won't give a dime to buy up milk. And this past few days they've been pouring milk in the rivers of California because they cannot get the price they want. While our people in Mississippi have no more food stamps than Alabama and Georgia. And they're eating starch three times a day. Our government does not love its people. But I'm telling you, you've got to be ready to be so satisfied to live what God is. God is love, and love is socialism. And socialism means from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Some say, I'm working so hard, and everybody else doing so little. That's the way it is till the revolution comes. But because some of you are working so hard, and you are giving of your ability, that's the motto. That's what I am when they say they look to Jim Jones. They're not looking to Jim Jones. They're looking to God, which is love, which is socialism, which is from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And I know that oftentimes you get weary in well-doing because you have such ability and people will pull from you and others will sit in here and they will drink up and parasites like little leeches that pull on you take the last drop of blood. I saw two in council last night. One was living like Lazarus. They were, he was in heaven. One was in heaven. The other was in hell sitting at the same council table. One was worshiping capitalism. One had no love. The other one was on the road to socialism. But they were side by side, we shall say these two gentlemen, were side by side, and yet one of them was in hell. One of them had tasted of the waters of life, and the other had no knowledge. The one person had a freedom. The other person was all tied up. They had their money, they had their possessions, they weren't sharing what they had to give, but they were in hell, and anybody could see it all over their face. <laughs> and remember, all those that take, the takers, they get it. My rich uncle that my mother admired said, oh, what a wonderful marriage she has. He walked over everyone and had millions of dollars and drove Lincolns and Cadillacs. But at 56 years of age, he died, but not before being ill over a year before. He developed cancer, and his quiet, subdued little wife broke loose and brought every kind of man and party under his nose. And the last day, ten days of his life, while he was still conscious, he ran out of his last dime. She'd run him through, and she took off, and there was nobody even to stand with him while he died. The rich never prosper, always. Their end comes bitterly. I remember the sister that I healed from cancer here, Carrie Langston, who's now supervisor of one of our beautiful convalescent homes up in Redwood Valley, the black sister from Texas, who also died and I resurrected her. She told her the rich woman over here in Beverly Hills, all of her children, all of her people came in and stole her blind before she died, stripped her of everything she had. You heard her testify here, and I've heard that testimony from people after people of how rich people had to live under protection. Because when the final moments come, 
And finally, her own children poisoned her. Carrie went away. She said, please, Carrie, don't go away. But Carrie had to go away. She didn't think of Carrie when Carrie should have been thought of. She never gave Carrie any money to help her when Carrie had problems with her family, so she had to go. That's who is rich people. They always want, and they get that way, what they want for a while. They drain, drain dry everybody they can. But then finally, the worm turns. My uncle died and she died. That woman I just mentioned a few weeks ago died in Beverly Hills. And they got everything she had. All of her mansions in Beverly Hills and all of her resorts, they got her, poisoned her. Because when Carrie came back, exactly happened what she said would happen. And they covered it. Carrie had even seen them trying to poison her. And she said, they're going to poison me this time. Don't go. But she didn't want Carrie to stay bad enough to give her some money to help her with her own mother that was in need. So she died, like all rich will die, and deserve to die. And my uncle died, like all rich die, and deserve to die. And he died with only 22 people in his funeral, and his wife out with another man, and his millions gone. His son and his wife run through them all. The love of money is the root of all evil, and you think that now, and that's capitalism, and love of money is root of all evil, meaning capitalism, property, ownership. You pursue it, it'll kill you. You live by it, and your children will finally hate you. You won't keep your children, you won't keep your money. You lose everything. I wish we could develop in this house the joy in knowing that we have already won. And quit worrying about whether we're going to be in the promised land. Likely you will. Quit worrying about whether you're going to be resurrected and go on to the next heaven or another planet. Likely you will. Quit worrying about where you're going. My satisfaction is tonight that when the nuclear bombs drop and the elements melt with a fervent heat and cities of America all over burn down and are melted down to powder, my delight is in the law of my God. My God socialism. My delight is in the law of this great revolution. I know. I don't think anymore. I know that China will now survive a people that have freed their people of all pestilences. All the male disease, all flies, they have no rats in China, they have no hunger in China, they have no inflation in China, they have no rent. Child doesn't have to pay for a circus or for a music lesson, he doesn't have to pay for a doctor or a dentist, everything's free in China because the rich have met the fate that all rich are going to meet. Coolest city in the world. Van Landers and all the new people and all the doctors are going. Said there's no way that you can get the surgery or medicine like you get there. When you're ill, if you're a little worker on the street, there are 80 doctors who work over you. They've never lost anybody. A person can have their arm cut off out in the field by a tractor or a thrashing machine, and they save every one of the arms. They can transplant arms and even transplant other people's fingers. A finger that I've kept as a momentum of how I saved a black young man when a white person was going to kill him, and I put my hand and took the knife. In China, they can take that finger and put another finger on it. They have synthetic insulin. They don't have to kill an animals to give you insulin. They've developed an artificial insulin. They stop many of the diseases that are routine in 20 years. They spoke 600 languages 20 years ago. They were in a cave, and things looked bad. You get so weary and well-being, you say, we're going to win. Oh, we can't help but win. Just a few years ago, Mao Zedong and Lin, not, no, not Lin Pao, Lin Piao, but Chow and Lai were in a cave. The Chinese fascist nationalist Chiang Kai-shek 
with the backing of the Japanese warlords and American capital. Because American capital was making money in China right while we were fighting the Japanese. We had capital investments with Japanese in China. Did you know that? We had capital investments. Rockefeller had investments in oil in consort with the Japanese while we were fighting and the sons of the poor blacks were dying. Rockefeller was making money not only in China but in Germany. He was making money on both sides of the war. The day is coming. It's not seen. Maybe in your sight, but I can see it. I look into the hills and I hear the light of revolution coming. Now China has no one that has to have even operations by nice surgery, only in very rare cases. When cancer develops and it's fastly disappearing, strokes are very reduced because tensions are not there. The jails are closed in most every state in China. They have no lawyers because nobody cheats anybody. You don't have to lock your home, Ann Lander said, and all the people that go there. You don't have to lock a hotel room. You can lay anything down. Nobody steals from anybody. Oh, that's close to heaven. It's not our goals. It's not our way, but it's close to heaven. It's not this sheep fold, but it's other sheep which I have, which are not of this fold. No venereal disease in half of the children in this high school division of California, in all of California, by 1977 or 1980, will have syphilis. What are you doing over there? Don't you worry about water. You're going to be in hell, woman. You're going to be in hell, and you're going to cry for water, and you have no water. You're going to be in a capitalist concentration camp. You're going to be in an exploitive racist hell. Why don't you quit worrying about what the woman's doing with the water? And listen to me. I never ask that ordinarily. Ordinarily, I tell you to drink and let you pray around here. But now I want you to listen. I only put enough water to moisten my vocal cords that I'm giving to the revolution. Because they one day will be used up. And I'm glad. I don't take enough to quell or any way wet thirst need, uh, to wet that thirsty need. So what are we looking for? Victory of the person? Are we looking victory for our God? Victory of our cause? It isn't important what they do with me. Take no thought for what they shall do for you. Take no thought for what's still coming at our Spirit of truth is going to speak to you one way or the other. Spirit of truth will come out to you. Say, I can't read. I can't write. You can resist a racist oppressor. You can destroy the work of the devil. You know how to set a bonfire, don't you? You're all ordained to be here. As I said, it shows you're a chosen people. The avant-garde, the front line, the first ranks of the revolution. God, Christ, means a revolution. Christ means revolution. Christ means anointing. It means a revolution. You're the first ranks of it. How many have been with me ever since I had this temple? And I'm in you. See? Many are called, but few are chosen. Nearly everyone in this room has been with me from the beginning. People come and go because they're not ready for this free gift. They're not ready for the deliverance. They're not ready to overcome self, to lay down their life. Jesus said, no man will take my life, but I will lay down my life for my brethren.
and I can teach this very, very much because you are understand that particular epoch of history better than others. People said there's such great truths in the Bible. Well, I've got about 50 good ones, and there are thousands of pages in there, so that doesn't say too much for your book. It does say something for the speaker, because I had to search through all that dung to get 50 good quotes. I could have searched through Webster Dictionary and not had to go one page and have just as good a quote, but you're more accustomed to the Bible, so that's where I come. But you see, the Bible needs me. I don't need the Bible because I am the beginning and the end. Yesterday I told a woman her thoughts, deep thoughts, just exactly how she thought it before I healed her of her disease. Healed of her crippling disease from an accident. Told her thoughts. She's waving her hand. Told her thoughts. Only one can do that. The one you said wrote the Bible. Or the one you said spoke and some other fool wrote what he said. And how could any mortal fool be able to write what God said? But you said in the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was made flesh. And Hebrews 4, 12 said the Word will know your thoughts. Will know the intents of your heart. The Word will be able to separate soul from body or resurrect the spirit from the body. It will be able to separate the bone from the marrow. I've taken off casts off of sisters like this who broke her body in a hospital, broke her leg in two places. I cut it off just a couple of Sundays ago and she went back to hospital perfectly made whole. There she sits. Good God Almighty! Don't tell me what the Bible says. I know what's good in the Bible. I know what's rotten in the Bible because I am the Alpha. But more than that, more than that, I and you will be the Amiga. We have already won this revolution. If I did not do what I will do before I make that final translation for you and for those that love your God, we have already won the revolution because the nuclear bombs are going to fall. Even President Ford says so. All the nations say so. But after the bombs have fallen, China's going to dig out of their lovely caves a year later. So it is already a victory. The capitalists were too careless. Capitalist rich people use the property class, use the workers. They always abuse the workers. They never take care of the workers. They always deprive them of what they need. But the communists, the socialists, take care of their workers. And their workers are going to dig out of their caves, and today already socialism has won the victory over the world. <laughs> Hallelujah, revolution. Hallelujah. Forever so we meet our advent. Whether we meet our confrontation out on Alvarado, as they tried to set us up once in a riot here, I took you through that. I got you out of jail, and I will continue till the right moment comes. Then we may all go to jail. We'll all make a noise that will be heard around the world. It is wonderful. I remind you also that People's China that now has 800 million free of all forms of hunger, 
malnutrition, bodily deficiencies, no psychiatrists, no mental hospitals, no lawyers, no jails. But just a few years ago, just a quarter of a century ago, just 25 years ago or so, the two leaders of that nation were in a cave, and the fascist American Chinese were after them. And they said just exactly where to go, and there was only two left. Mao Zedong and Chow in Lai, and 30 top grade green berets like the ones that came out in the paper today in San Francisco in the, bur the barb. It came out that the green berets actually killed a Yendi. We landed our own green berets. One of them has come forward and confessed to a con congressional caucus that he was in it. They, they were Latin trained Green Berets and they landed speaking Spanish and murdered the socialist president. But that's how he could hold his head up high also. And Dr. Allende walked out with his helmet on his head. He said, I will not leave the governor's office. I will not leave my president's office. If you want me, come and get me. He moved that the revolution was already won. But a paramilitary professional outfit trained by the CIA, the U.S. Intelligence Division of the Army in those days, told him exactly where to find Mao, and he was hungry and beleaguered the leader of China. And the 30 top-notch men got there, and they were too lazy to go into the cave. For some reason, they were afraid or lazy, and they just went back and reported to their division commander, he ain't there. And if they had taken 15 more yard steps, China wouldn't be there today. There'd still be a million people dying a day. Castro, in 1953, didn't know that he was ever going to see the light of day. Now they have free medicine and all the other things. We're going down there to court them. Little Island, our president sent down Senator Javits and another senator. We've got to go down there because they got the sugar. We, we need what they got. Yeah. Little old Island. In the middle of the Caribbean, where it used to be around the churches, the Assemblies of God that owned the prostitution houses. Pentecostal churches owned the prostitution houses and had little girls in them at 9 and 10. Sister Jesus and I went in and got them out before Castro came to power. They were put in there, put in chains at night so they couldn't get out. Right under an assembly of God church, I tore hell out of it with my preaching and took the children away. But today, a little island, just a little island that used to be just nothing but a den of thieves, and poor, poor black people couldn't even go to the beaches. Yeah. Couldn't even go to the beaches because of the color of their skin. But the revolution came, and the beaches that were prepared for the rich were open to the poor black, and the rich couldn't go on the beaches. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. But in 1953, Castro was arrested, and he never thought he'd see victory. All he said one day, he couldn't get an attorney to defend him. He stood in the court all alone. His family disowned him. Son of a rich, he could have been rich just like I. He had wealth, he had money. He didn't have to take that way of suffering. He stood up, nobody to defend him. Couldn't get one lawyer in the whole nation to defend him. And he said, history, I will no doubt die, but history will absolve me. They charged him with sex crimes. They charged him with all kinds of sexual deviation. They charged him with criminal behavior of every type. They dirtied his name in every newspaper. He was ruined in the eyes of Cubans. But he knew that somewhere in the revolution, his God had already had the victory. That's why he held his head up high. Just a young man, he held his head up high, and he said, I need no defense. 
History, history will absolve me. History will prove the rightness of my cause. I know trouble's brewing for me. Trouble's brewing for you. Jesus got a cross. We may get several. But I'll tell you one thing. There won't be silence on our Golgotha's brow. If they hang one of us on a tree, they'd better damn well hang several of us because we're going to make a lot of noise. <laughs> Hallelujah. The revolution is won because China is feeding its people soybeans, all the things, apricot seeds and sunflower seeds that makes them radiation resistant so the nuclear war is not going to hardly phase them. In the first place, they'll be able to come out a year later after the bombs that have blown away the Nixons and the Kissingers and the Rockefellers and the DuPonts. Honey, I'd be glad to be blown away, too, just to see them blown away. But our spirit is reincarnatable. And in the next minute, we're able to wake up as little babies in the new world. Because our spirit marches on. We might find ourselves Chinese the next time. Makes no difference. And it makes no difference if we have no future. Because if we want a future, we will lose our life. And if we lose our life, we will find our life. Don't think that the day of small things that you're defeated. Oh, I have got many aces up my sleeve. I have got many. Days are going to get heavy. There'll be trials and tribulations because they that live godly in this revolutionary Jesus. Jesus means justice. See, all those words are symbols. Jesus means justice revolutionary justice they that live good in this revolutionary justice christ meaning revolutionary they that live good live perfectly in this revolutionary justice will suffer persecution they'll lie on you they'll kill you even thinking they do their sky god of service they'll throw us out of their churches but honey we don't throw out easy when we get put up against the wall So if we reach the promised land, be glad. If we do not, be glad. People say here they're wondering all the time, what's Father doing? Father is suffering it to be so. Father is suffering the revolution to be so. Someone was wondering if Father or Mother had a romance with anyone. We would never have a romance with anyone. We are in complete love with the revolution. We would never be led around by sex. No, no. And if we were using sex, it would not be to you the great, with great ability, unless you had a special task to perform. It'd be those that's of need. So if you hear me in sex, it'll be somebody that owns a Cadillac or a Jaguar that I'm trying to get a hold of. I do not expect you to hear me in such a position. And some know what I'm talking about when I drop that last little phrase. I do not have to say much, but you get the message. I'm going to tell you, if you worship Cadillac and Lincolns and Jaguars or any other car, 
precious, beautiful, misplaced soul. So don't worry about whether I love anyone. I love everyone. Don't worry about whether I would respond to someone sexually. No, not that alone. I could not. Someone who has need of, someone who deserves, or someone who is kind, or someone who never believed they had any beauty or love, if it came to that. But why don't we just get out of it? Because that's where we are. Why don't we stay out of it? Why don't we grow up? Because capitalism, America, has reached its lowest point of extremity. You can find no love. The dear sister wants to have a marriage, and I see your heart's need and desire. But you have nothing but hell. There's nothing but hell in these marriages because capitalism breeds self-centeredness. Socialism breeds self-sacrifice. Socialism will cause people to lose their self. Capitalism tells you to worship yourself. And so everybody's in love with themselves today. They all ought to get a long old-type mirror, hall mirror, put it in bed and wiggle in front of it because that's what people like is themselves. If you don't, just tell them one time. No, they love, they're passionate to get to you. Tell them you can't kiss. Your kiss is like the kiss of a groundhog. And you'll find they don't want to kiss you one more time. So if it was you that they were interested in, they'd still want to kiss you. But when they find out you are not interested in them, you become ugly to them. You've got to kiss their rear end in order for them to love you. And if you don't kiss their rear end, wait on them, let them possess you like a little puppy dog, they won't have any use for you. If you tell them the truth, they'll kill you. Like this dear woman that at least tried to be free and join this temple but caught up between two worlds, double-minded, and that causes instability in all your ways, going back and forth in the holiness circle, but at least she give her car to our good civil rights movement across the nation, left that holiness husband. He loved her. Oh, he said how much he missed her. He missed her enough to charge her with forgery stealing and put her in jail and that's where Tish Leroy is right now making the arrangements to get her out on a five thousand dollar bail she is facing a minimum of five years and that's exactly oh said my husband my wife wouldn't do that you just tell them the truth you tell them everything you feel for the next two days every honest feeling you have about them Tell them in two days, and that love that you think that they have will turn to wrath, and they won't want to be penetrating you with the penis, but rather a knife. <laughs> One of the people said here it'll take only two minutes, and that's probably closer to the truth, but I wanted to give you a good trial because some of you don't know the truth and some of you be playing around for two minutes. I mean starting out now. You think somebody loves you but father? Start telling them the truth. You find out. Tell them the whole truth. Tell them exactly what you don't like about them. Their arrogance, their way they've used you, possessed you, abused you, cheated you. Tell them. See what happens. I'll give you a million dollars if you do it. You still come back in two days. Don't tell them what you're doing, because if you do that, then naturally they put on a front. But in this room are people who've turned me in across the promised land, those smiling faces of our socialist community over there, so people live, love, work, healthy, no sickness, nobody dying. Two people there are traitors. 
I mean past traitors. Oh, let me qualify. One of them turned me in the FBI. The other tried to tear my clothes off of me in a courtroom when he was after Brother Iron. But he's over there working now. Because I love. I forgive. You don't know if you've got that much forgiveness yet. Don't speak too quickly. Don't speak too quickly how much. There are people here that tell me every kind of murderous thing. People say, Father, I want to kill you because you interfere with my life. I dream about murdering you. You want to interfere with my life. I don't want to save you. The part of iniquity in me, the self-life, the mortal, carnal, capitalist life, doesn't want to save you. And I want to kill you. I have people that have carried it out to the degree that brought a knife saying, I want to get the right time. And yet I love them. And yet I have worked with them, and some of them have become roses of Sharon, brighter than the morning star. No, you'll find that only one loves you, the firstborn of many sisters or brethren, the firstborn revolutionary, the first one in America, the chief revolutionary. And surely you cannot do harm by following me. Mao did not have as high a spirit and loving a spirit as I, and yet he has created a great country because he went through many sexual escapades and other things. But even in his half dedication, out of it came a people without hunger, 800 million strong. Fidel also had a lot of things in his life that were different than my dedication. But out of it has come an avenue that's not our avenue because we are American Christian socialists. But out of it's come hope. There's no longer starving people. There's no prostitution. Not a person has to give their body to feed themselves as it is common on every street in this town. There are no prostitutes in people's socialist China or people's socialist Cuba. There are no drugs. There are no murders. They've had no murders this year. 800 million. 800 million. We have 225 million. And we have 10, 15 murders a night sometimes in the city of Los Angeles. And they have not had one murder in a year. Hear me now. So we have won. Makes no difference if they came today to take us away. Although they would not get that done without us making a revolution. We are nonviolent socialists. We will do no harm to anyone, but we will resist those who try to harm any of our loved ones. We will resist them to the last measure of our devotion. We will resist them with blood. Shift yourself. Kiss your neighbor on the cheek, for that's where we're going, leftward. I don't have a watch. I've talked to you. Should this message? It is very important that you comprehended what I said. And if you did not, you should ask some question only related to what I have said. For I said, your joy should be in giving your life. They said, Jesus loved you. Peace, everyone, now. Let us cease from our talking. Would the Father do and greater than everyone would do that came after him? These things that I do shall you do and greater. That's the words out of your own Bible. Jesus died on a cross, the easiest thing to do. I live, suffer with people, their selfishness, their infamy, and every night it's the same. There are redeeming moments for us to sit in those council chambers. We sat there from seven or something, nearly 12 hours, seven last night or 7.30 till six o'clock in the morning. 
That's what we were doing in that council. Getting the ministry's minds together, getting counselors' minds together, because charity has to begin at home. You've got to get your own house in order. Peace. And then we counsel with others that remain. Some must have not remained because they are not used to waiting. We've got some folk around here that think that they're worth more than others because they have, um, they think, certain beauty, special wealth, certain privilege. Church of God and brought his Church of God congregation and is so applicable. He's one of my most beautiful revolutionaries now, the holiness pastor, that's our associate up in San Francisco, Reverend Edwards, brought the entire Church of God in Christ, Church of God Triumph in, brought his whole church into our church, joined with it. So did Reverend Pilfoy White Man brought his entire Church of God holiness. But I see some of those children wanting again, they ought to be hearing this message, at least hear one. I'd like to know they hear one a day, one a year, rather. So she's accustomed to going in these holiness churches. The first thing the holiness preacher will do is show he is a liar and a hypocrite. He'll go to bed once. That's about all he's good for. He has, because he's so weird, he can't go to bed with the same one twice. You know what I'm talking about. Please. Some of you men say, I'm a man. I've had many women. Well, some of us who have been with one woman for 25 years until we reached the plane of understanding that evolved above it and went to sex every night and then sometimes three times a day with the same woman. Now, let me tell you, we've got a whole lot more normalcy than you because all doctors will tell you, all psychiatrists, when you've got to run from woman to woman, you're a homosexual because you can't stand women and that's why you keep running around looking. And I'm going to talk to some of these flighty women running loose here. And every time you run from man to man, you're a lesbian. All psychiatrists got your number. Everybody else, all the rest of us are, but the, at least the rest are settled down. And some of you got a burr in your tail. Acting out. You think we think you're lovers. We just stand and feel sorry for you. Because it's obvious that you don't know a thing about love. When you have to run and flirt with this little bit and warm up to that one and get all hot and bothered and have one little frenzy back and then it's over. Then you go to somebody else. You think we envy you, we feel sorry for you. We wish, in fact, you'd straighten up or get out of our sight till you grow up, because it's pitiful. You don't enchant us, we don't want what you got, looking, slobbing over each other. Honey, we know that that is capitalistic greed. We know that's possessive narcissism. We don't want any of that disease, we've been through it. Take it, get it out of our sight, we don't like it. Working for a society where there's no rich or poor, black or white. Where well, I'm working for a society where the oil companies cannot do what they're doing right now. Curbing the market and driving the little independent out of business and telling you there's a gas shortage and he gets by with this. Please listen to me. And all the Senate, Senate's even talking about it. And nobody doing anything about it. The oil companies owning, the big oil companies owning the whole of the gas market and able to throttle up 180 little businesses have been closed in Northern California. 180 gas stations have been closed in Northern California alone. And they just keep throttling and tell you that there's a shortage. Yeah, if they want to charge me with thing uh, that I'm against that, if they want to charge me that I'm against the rich getting by like they are in California, 
hundred so that did not pay their income tax this year, but made upwards of a million dollars. But they want to put me on the court and try me that say, Jim Jones is against that, then I would like to get that case started. I would like things to be built around a proper principle. I want to get down to the nitty gritty. I want to get down to the harder things. I don't want to get in, in the court if I can avoid it over who prayed to who or who did the healing, Jesus or Jim. I think that would get us sidetracked. So I agree with these attorneys and say on the radio, go ahead and say it. Because if they don't say on the radio that I get this thing done through prayer, you and I are all guilty of a federal crime. Because they have got it set up so nobody will get back in the place. Nobody's going to come in the place of that lying Jesus. Nobody's going to come in the place of that old sky god. They've got it all fixed up so nothing new that's real and true can get through. You understand what I'm saying? They've got it fixed up. You don't use Jesus then. Sure, the Jesus that let people waste the people's money. The Jesus that said in King James, the poor you have with you always. So he never said it. The only reason I say he never said it is because you got to make me him. And I sure wouldn't have said it. I wouldn't have said it. You got to make me him. Some of you, if I was not him, you wouldn't be here. Now I know some of you would. There's good Reverend Edwards back there. He wouldn't give a damn if I'd been a monkey's ass the last time. Wouldn't make no difference to him who I was the last time. He's been a pastor of a church of white God. He'd be there. Stand up, Reverend. He's been a pastor of a big church. But it wouldn't make any difference to him if the last time I'd been a fish worm, he'd be here. But some of you church folk, I had to be that very same Jesus. Well, if you're going to make me that very same Jesus, then I sure would not do what he did. They would never set me down. Let me get that chair, I'll bust my... I would never sit down and let a woman, man, nor any other living creature wash my feet. I won't want anybody looking down. I don't want anybody looking up. So well, people in here praise you. You know why. Because you have got to have that kind of condition in order to build faith. I don't know why we can't believe and do it, but we have to build in, in a kind of superstition around me. I don't know why you don't know this woman was crippled. I healed her. This leg was crippled and it gave her pain and the operation couldn't do any good, but I took care of it. You haven't had any more pain than I took care of it, have you? This woman was dead and I raised her. She had cancer and I took it out. But somehow, I don't know why we can't believe that unless there's somebody saying, I know your God. I believe. I don't know why we can't keep it. Just when I walk down through here and say, oh, how in the hell are you today? Okay. You, see, you know. How you feeling? How you feeling, girl? What's happening with you? Are you driving lately? Yeah. Hmm? Are you cool? You know. If I said that about a week, folk wouldn't have enough faith in here for me to do the works that I need to do. So we've got to walk around here and say, I know you are God. I know. Oh, I'm Jim. That's what I am. But we've been so brainwashed. We don't want a revolution. We want a patch job. We want a patch job. We don't want to make a sudden change. You've been talking about in the church for years, you must be born again. Hell, you never did believe that. You meant, I want to partially be born again, but I want to hold on to a little of the old. I don't want to be something new. Said, behold, you are a new creature. I'll make you a new creature if you'd let me. But no, no. You want to carry a little Bible? You want to carry a little old song? You want to have a little that old prayer? You want to have that little old Jesus shit talking inside of you?
house. I heard the voice. I heard the spirit. Jesus spoke to me. The Lord spoke to me. The spirit goes Jim. Jim, spirit. You just gotta, you just can't quite make it Jim all the time. It's a spirit. Spirit showed me. Spirit of what? The spirit of Jim didn't show you no damn spirit showed you anything. God is. We are together. We wouldn't get these people here. They, they want a God, folks. They don't want a revolutionary. There's just a few of us here that want a, want a revolutionary. The majority of people wouldn't come here because I start saying, is it cool, honey? What's happening? What's been going on with you? You've been jiving at it. If I start talking like that, folk would not come. If I'd walk in here and say, now, folk, let's get down to it. Let's plan our strategy. Let's build a few more buildings. Now, hold your faith just right. If you know you've got faith in me, I don't have to tell you nothing. I don't have to tell you a word. All you have to do is just like Sister Johnson, just believe around me, know that I've got an extraordinary kind of psychic power, an extraordinary kind of gift, and just know that when I walk by you, if you've got that faith in me, then it'll do the work. <laughs> it would be so wonderful we could sit down here and we could make some plans. We get our money, but no, you get your money. You don't get no money, you gotta say. <laughs> gotta stand here and bless. Well, I don't have to put up my hands to bless. I put up my hand because some damn fool won't help us save the world. They won't help us until I take a religious stance. I don't have to move my finger to do what I need to do. I don't have to say a word to move what I have to do. Sometimes I know how hard it is for you because it's hard for me. And it's much harder for me having to do it than you having to sit watching. Believe me, however hard you think it is sitting watching, it's much harder on me because if people wanted what I really was, I would have peace. But they want me plus that sky guard shit. They want to wrap that shit up in Jim Jones and kind of put the two together. They don't want me apart from it. They want to mix me with that shit. You know what I'm talking about? Dung, dung of the scriptures. I'm talking about Solomon's dunghill. Only you and I will be in our old nigger day we call it chip pie. They want to mix me up with that man. I remember back in the days when it was honest in the peace mission, and he'd speak to my, my heart. MJ would say, uh, say I, I don't like any of this routine. But this is where the people are. But unfortunately, something happened with him in the peace mission movement. He stayed where the people were. And finally he became like something that he wasn't when I first met him. He died and his secretaries arose. And it was no longer M.J. Divine. It was a secretary. It was a system. It was an institution. It was Cadillacs and diamonds. There was nothing left of what was formerly there because the sky god, the disease, had taken over. They had made him the same kind of God that they had worshipped in the former days. And how many times, I'll never forget the longest day when I went to him, because I felt in my Indian mystic, I came to him, another mystic knows another mystic. And I'd known where he'd been from. I'd come from the same plane. I was part and parcel of the same socialism. They walked in the days of the first days of peace mission. They walked out in the roads. Simon and some of them carried banners with the, with, the, with the socialists. They carried them down the streets. Oh, and I wanted to teach him so bad. And I'd sit down and I'd talk to him about it. And he'd love to listen to socialism. But they'd get around. Oh, Mrs. would get around. Mrs. Devine would get around. I could never get to him. They'd always interfere with anything I had to say. She just get in with her nice clothes and her fancy ways. I could never talk to him. And I'll never forget the last time. 
He looked at me and he said, get out of here. Whatever mantle I have, it's with you. He said, get out of here. He said, don't die like I'm going to in here. I'll never forget that as long as I lived. That's what he told me in Philadelphia. And I went on out the door and I stepped back. I said, you ought to come with me. And he started to walk like a poor little old man. He started to walk and those secretaries put a circle around him. And that's the last time I saw him alive. Because he wanted to go. I said, come and go with me. And we'll be like you were when you were free. When people didn't tell you. When they didn't mix up this religion with you. Well, I could talk to him so straight the secretaries would feel it was blasphemy. And they would forbid me to come. And he would put my tapes on the whole damn network. He'd demand when he had any grace or any strength left. He'd demand. They'd forbid me to come in his place. They called him God, you know. And they, he, they'd forbid me to come in. And he'd say, let him come. And they'd be so mad that they could bite nails. And he'd put my tapes, he'd put my sermons right over. If you in the old days in Peace Mission, you remember, my voice was preached there 20 years ago. 20 years ago through Circle Mission, my voice went all over the place. And he would mix them, and those secretaries would just stew. Because I'd say, he's going to die like anybody else because you don't have the vision. And I'd say it publicly, and they'd get mad, oh, they'd get mad. And he'd say, leave him alone. There was a little bit left in him. But before it was over, there was nothing left. It was a shell. They'd made him their own sky god. And the spirit and the consciousness of socialism was gone. There was nothing but Cadillacs and diamond rings and jewels. And the upper class and the lower class, the basement folk that eat downstairs, and upstairs in come all the honkies and all the special people to sit around the table. Oh, my, my. What can happen if you lose the spirit? I've heard him talk. You haven't heard him talk. He, he'd let down his hair, what little of it. He didn't have much, but he'd let it down with me. He'd let his, I mean, he had no hair, but he'd let his, you know, what we mean by hair down. He just let his soul open to me. And he'd say, you're just like me. Be free. That's almost his exact words. You're just like me. Be free. But the saddest thing to hear a man that once led a movement that was with socialists that were marching down the streets of Harlem that once said, this is what we need. We need com communization. We need it. And to see it turn clear around and have his writing say that it's all bad. I can't believe he ever said it. I believe somebody made him say it. I believe somebody put stuff in his food towards the left. I don't believe he knew his right hand from his left hand towards the left. I believe in the end they were running the show. I know they didn't write the letters that he was supposed to write. I did say letters written by M.J. Devine and were more written by M.J. Devine than my Tomcat. They were written by secretaries without ever talking to him. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. You know what I'm afraid of, though? That we may not be able to build a mo movement. I remember sitting down one time telling him, they called him God, see. I said, there's no God out there that's loving. There's no God in the universe would make people hungry like that. He'd chuckle. He'd chuckle. He'd kind of rub his head. He said, you know, people. He said, little brother, he told me, little brother, people are not going to be able to digest that. And people won't be able to accept that. And I think that's where he's going to be right. Because people are not ready to digest that. People have just got to believe there's something other than Jim Jones. <clears throat> Jim Jones isn't musical enough. Jim Jones isn't melodious enough. Jim Jones in person, why, my, he isn't that beautiful. <clears throat> but when he comes in the bedroom, when he whips in on a spirit, yes. when he speaks to me in the night, then I can make him like I want him to be. Oh. We never want to take life like it is. We want to make life something other than what it is. We're always trying to shape it into what we'd like it to be. 
There's nobody to help you but Jim Jones. There's nobody. Jim Jones may come into your room and he may not. But if he doesn't help you, nobody will help you. If you keep these thoughts in your mind, you're going to get more help than any other people on earth. If you think on him, you have more success, more health, you have more freedom than anyone else. If you think on him, when 10,000 church people go to jail, you will be able to go free for every 10,000 church people that go to jail. I mean, that's just how many times they'll go to jail and you go free. They can try 10,000 times over to get their sky guard to do it, and 10,000 of them will fail before the 10,000 and one that'll get some success and maybe something will come to them. But thus far, none of my immediate co-workers, none of my immediate friends, none of my immediate children, I, I'm afraid of the word children, because then we get back into the other thing again. God, son, God, servant, father, son, father looking down at son, son looking up at father. That's why I would prefer to call you my friend. I'll be glad to be fatherly to you, whatever you call that word. But there are a lot of things about fathers that ought to be shot. <laughs> the old idea we've had of fathers, fathers are to be heard. And fathers are to be listened to. And fathers always know best. Well, my father didn't know best. I'm glad I didn't listen to my father. When I walked in with my black friend, when I was just 16 years of age, I took my black friend up. He said, you don't bring him here. He said, you come in here with him, and you never come back again. And I looked at his face, and I didn't have, you better just stay awake. I said, uh, I didn't have a damn dime in my pocket. And I didn't know where I was going to go that night. He said, you don't come in with him. I said, then I don't come in. He said, have it your own way. I did. My father was not right. He was wrong. I was right. There's a whole lot of things about this father-son business. Just because a father, we're supposed to like him. Just because somebody played in bed, we're supposed to love them because they went to bed to do their thing and we happened along and then we're supposed to honor them all the days of our life. And we carry that thing over, our religion, it carries right over. Because daddy, daddy, you do what daddy says. To hell with it if daddy doesn't say what's right. If daddy doesn't say what's right, don't do it. I love that lingering here. Sunday, I leaned over one of the 300. I picked up a little girl and I said, There's something bothering you. No, Father. You know, yes, there is. Someone's hurt you. It's all right, Father. Finally, came to me. I said, Who hit you? She said, It's a, uh, she said, it's a rag. I said, That's not a rag. I said, Who hit you? Well, Mama hit me with my hand, her hand. I said, her hand. I said, a belt. She said, but don't tell her. Singing in my choir. Singing in my choir in Los Angeles. Had beat that little girl on the side of the I said, oh no, you didn't tell me. And I went up to that microphone and I said, no follower of mine cracks the head of a child. And I said, this child didn't tell me. And I said, if this child gets anything done to this child, you are through with me. I said, I don't want to hear no more of this child being hit in the face. Mother's right, so mother can smack and beat. Daddy's right, so daddy can talk around the hell with that business. Daddy's right when he acts right. Mama's right when she acts right. we carry that God. You see, God, Father, Father, then God is to be respected. You don't question God. Nobody questions God. God says, you shit in the middle of the street, you shit in the middle of the street. 
That's the way we have had our faith. God says that there was, there was a boat. Noah put every animal on the boat, he put every insect on the boat, and every crawdad on the boat, and every rattlesnake on the boat, and every form of life on the boat, and every form of disease. Don't make any difference what God said. If God said it, it's right. If God said that Jonah could uh, be swallowed by a fish, and a fish could keep him for three days, don't make no difference, honey. So, well, I don't believe nobody. Now, God said that. You wouldn't believe what anybody else told you, but God said it. You know, no, no, you know nobody's going to live in no fish's abdomen for three days. You know nobody going to get, nobody going to go get two monkeys and two rattlesnakes and two rabbits, only two, and two rats and two mice. By the time you had two rabbits, you'd have five because it'd be about getting two hippopotamuses and two giraffes and all that stuff. Nobody believed that except God said it. And you know how long that boat was? About from me to that wall. About as high as you go up there by the measurement up there as you go to the top of that uh, curvature. Now, honey, that wouldn't get you. You put four, you put two elephants and two hippopotamus on the damn thing, it sinks. <laughs> I'm telling you the stuff we believe. Joshua comes out and he wants to win a battle. And he says, Son, stand still. If the sun had stood still, the trees would have gone up and the water would have belched out and the mountains would have pulled out. If the sun stood still, the world would have gone. The world would have pulled in a million pieces because when the sun stopped, there's real trouble. But we don't doubt it because he said, that God said it. The sun stood still. I see you. And I'd go on with those crazy stories all night. Adam and Eve. All those crazy stories. And we still believe them. I'd get people up in the preaching. They'll get up and testify and they'll, they'll still... Now nobody's going to poison that in midair. And they do is relieve my God's throat. <laughs> Adam and Eve and all that junk. God is lonely up there in space. I'm going over this one more time. I won't do it for a long while. God was up there. He created all the world. He went, <laughs> there was a star. And <laughs> over there was another planet. And he was just throwing his pit balls around. And had them... He looked around and he saw, he spit a few up there on that ceiling, he spit a few over there and he looked around and said, oh God, I'm getting tired of this shit. <laughs> he spewed all the stars out and he spewed all the planets out and he spewed everything he could spew out. He, nothing else left to do, he farted a couple of times. <laughs> He looked around, there wasn't no mama God. There wasn't no other kind of God, so he had to sit there and he said, oh, shit. <laughs> Keep on, child. If you, get, if you die, I'll raise you up. <laughs> he said, it's too much. He said, it's lonely out here in these stars and these moons and these planets. I got nobody here to talk to me. Now, if he'd have been like me, at least if I'd have found myself in a mess like that after I farted, I'd have made another one like me. I'd have made another one like me if I was going to make anybody, but I'd looked around over that cold world and I said, well, I don't know how in the hell I got to be God, but I'm going to at least be good enough to stay alone. Cold space and all these cold stars and I roared out a few planets and I roared out a few talk to these people because they'll leave the day they're going to be mad. They run, when they run, they run mad and be sure to talk to them because they'll lose their life, leaving me. they lose their life. But this, this tears up people. They don't want the truth. I only give you this every six months and I'll bet you to my born day there'll be 10% reduction in membership tonight. 
It always happens. Then I have to build up a few more church folk, and then six months later, I tear them down again. <laughs> now, if that had been Daddy Jim out there in that mess, now, I'm sorry, Lord, watch your hand. I should not have done that. Um, Lord, watch your hand. You really must not. Uh, I, I doubled it up inside, but anyway, you put your hand out, and I wasn't even taking it. But you see, that's the kind of God I'm thinking, but God, he don't care nothing about, he just, he don't say nothing, he's just lonely. Shit, he's out there, so he's just... <laughs> Well, I think I'll make me another God. Well, hell, he's liable to throw some of this shit at me that I've been throwing out here. <laughs> ain't gonna do that. But I don't want none of them stars come rolling at me. Well, I'll fix me up a few little old dingy dingies, just little old creatures that walk around and kick on my toes, and when I say moo, he says, yes, sir. So he plopped him out a few angels, farted him out a few more. Not too big now, not too big. He didn't want them too big because they might be able to get as tough as he was. And then he says, uh, I got it made now. And he said, You go over here and you do this, and you go over here and you do this, and you sing Hosanna, I'll bust your ass. <laughs> and they all say, Hosanna. The cherubims and the seraphims, they all saying, Hosanna. He made one. He, he didn't take too much time, though. He started one a little too quick. And that was Lucifer. You say, I don't like your story. Honey, my story makes more sense than your Adam's story. <laughs> Talk to them as they go down, honey, because their souls are petrified if they get, if they get out of here. She's all right. That one's all right. All right. He farted too quick on that one, then. and that was, that was a loose fart, and they called him Lucifer. See, that's what it was in the original. I got one sister back there nodding, and she believes it's true. That was a loose fart. But down through the Hebrew and the Greek, they got that shot, and they called it Lucifer. But what it was, it was a loose fart. See, all the rest of them had been controlled farts, but that was a loose... <laughs> Keep sweet, honey. Keep sweet. Because when you need to get healed, when you need to get saved, when you need to get resurrected, if I don't do it, you won't get it. Because there's nobody that can raise the dead. There's nobody that can take you in when you're homeless. There's nobody that can get you out of the prison. There's nobody that can make dogs come back when they've been gone and bring them out of nowhere and set them down. Mm -mm. There's nobody that can take the young man up there when he's right in the middle of an inferno, right in the middle of a hell, right in the middle of a fiery furnace, and can the walls go boom, boom, 25 feet, and he can find a path because I made a way where there was no way. I shouldn't have to make references like that, though. That's more of that, we're not the complete birth, you know. But I had to throw a little bit of that in, because somebody liable to walk out on the only friend they had. So Lucifer, Lucifer, he got, he wasn't a control fart like the rest of them. He was a... <laughs> Take a picture of my little turtle, that'd be, that'd be me good friend. <laughs> But he, he, just too, he just didn't think quite enough, and he let that fart loose too quick. And that fart got loose, and he said, what that old shit fart me out here for? He said, now let me tell you, Lucifer, you get up here and you say, amen. Lucifer tried it a few times, and he said, to hell with this. 
So I didn't ask to get here. And all oh, what you know that, that you know those you know those farts that you loose. Those are the most beautiful farts of all. There's nothing like a fart that is loose. It is. He said, what are you doing this, Father? I'm saving somebody from having a heart attack. And laughter is good medicine. I know what I'm doing. I'm not just trying to be cute here tonight or teach you something. I'm trying to build a metabolism. I'll make myself look like an ass if I can heal you. That's the thing about me. You just don't understand me. I'm too wide for some people to comprehend. Too high for some people to understand. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm also too low for you to get under me. I'm loosening up some bodily processes that need to be loosed here tonight. So that part that was loosed, it was, a, and always when you let them go, quick, you control them, they'll come out, invariably they'll be there, thinking it, and they won't, they won't quite, see, they won't quite feel right, because you're just trying to sneak them out. But when you, but when you, <laughs> when you just say, oh, well, I'm just going to loose it, it goes, it's beautiful. So, so that beauty, that Lucifer part, he, Lucifer part, he said, no, now I'm telling you one thing. I didn't ask to be farted out in this mess. Uh, he looked around, he see all these other dumb angels going, amen, amen, hallelujah. Going around, around, Lucifer said, I, I'm not going to do that. Mm -mm. I'm not going to go around that fool. Bad enough being farted out of him, but I'm going to get away from him. So Lucifer, he goes around in that circle while they go around saying, Hallelujah, glory. He said, Let me, you damn fool. He said, What are you doing that for that fool up there? He said, Come on with me. Come on with me. Let's get away from this fool and go up and set our own place where we can fart free. <laughs> he said, He had a free fart. We ought to have a free fart. Everybody ought to have a free fart. He said, what's good for the old fart's good for the new fart. And I'm telling you, that guy had no longer, he had no sooner had his fart until one third of them had taken off. And here he was in some trouble. Now he's supposed to... <laughs> so, I mean, you know, he's supposed to be intelligent, they're supposed to be, he's supposed to be wise. But he wasn't so wise as the world has told you. He wasn't so wise as all religion tells you because he was so dumb that he didn't even control his fart. He had a Lucy fart, and Lucy fart let all the other control farts out. And they went down and started doing their own fart on a little old pile of shit down there that he threw out. <laughs> he threw a pile of shit out there called Earth. My they were down there dancing around having fun with it. They were loosening their farts all around. He said, I'm going to put some stop to this. I'm going to put some stop to this. I'm going to make somebody serve me. All these Lucy Farts loose, and all these Lucy Farts angels, and all these angels running loose here. He said, I'm going to take more time this time. I'm going to make me some shit. So I'm going to shape it up well this time. I'm not going to lose no farts. So he shaped him up some shit. He laid him out one there, a big one, and he, laid, he, he set him out there, that shit, and he, he put two little dots in the head, and he put a little dot in the middle of the shit, and, he, and then he pulled out a little shit here, and put a little, he said, I'm going to make this a walking shit. I'm going to make this. So I, this time I'm going to make it right. So I'm going to make somebody or make, make me look like I'm the right kind of daddy only that I should be. So after all, I'm, a, I'm, I'm God. There's no sense all these Lucy Fox running all loose here. I should have stayed alone, but now I've done done it. So I'm going to have to do something here and make something that will show up these loose Fox. Hear me, old shit there laying there. He said, well, i got to breathe on this shit because it looks bad. 
queen spit on a ship and the ship rose. Uh, well, then Adam got up there. He called that shit. He called that Adam. In the Greek, that means shit. And he, he, he picked that up. And Adam went up and says, I feel like shit. I'm telling you the way it was, honey. You got it all wrong. I'm telling you the way it was. He said, now, Adam says, I'm a lonely shit. Oh, God said, I've done done it now. I'm going to have to make me something else here now. So he says, lay back down there, Adam, and he plucked a little bit of shit out of the side. That's all you women all been, you know, just little side shit. That's all you ever amount to. Now, you know that's where you've been treated all your life. You've been treated like side shit. So he plucks, he plucks a little of that side shit out, and he flops it down. He, he, she's, not, she's, not, she, she's not worth, she's a woman, after all. She come out of the man. She's not worth the time to build a whole big shit pile. I'm not going to do that for no woman. Hell no. I'm going to just take a little bit of that shit I already made, because she's not worth a whole big blob of shit. So he plucks a little out there. I'm talking about your story, how stupid it sounds. Now, this is how stupid it sounds, and I'm using this language because that's just how stupid the whole stuff sounds. <laughs>